Good morning. It's my privilege to welcome you here. David Nival was the founding scholar and leader of North Park College and Theological Seminary. Uh, he, uh, he was president twice of the college and then stayed on in the latter part of his career as dean of the seminary. Uh, but the whole time, the whole time he was teacher, a deep commitment to the vocation of teaching. And so this lectureship celebrates uh, that gift, that founding gift of, uh, of teaching. Today it's our privilege to, uh, to welcome a gifted teacher, Father Elizondo, to our, to our lecture series. And we, you grace us by being here. And we're, we're privileged. And we, we look forward to that. But I just want to welcome faculty, students, uh, pastors, and people from the community. I want to welcome the online community, Covenant Media Services, covering this event and, uh, and just celebrate the opportunity, the opportunity to receive uh, a lifetime of teaching, of insight. And um, I came across this quote from John Steinbeck as I thought of this morning in our lectureship. And it says this, I have come to believe that a great teacher is a great artist and that there are as few as there are of any other great artist. Teaching might even be the greatest of the arts since the medium is the human mind and spirit. John Steinbeck. Welcome, welcome to this lecture series that is founded on the vision of a great teacher and welcome today as we hear the gifts of one of our great teachers of our generation. So glad you're here and uh, we celebrate this morning. I'm Michelle Clifton Soderstrom and I teach theology and ethics here at North Park Seminary and I'm delighted to introduce Father Virgilio Elizondo, endowed professor of pastoral and Hispanic theology at the University of Notre Dame and he's also a fellow, to, fellow for the Institute for Latina Studies and Kellogg Institute. In 2007, Father Elizondo received the Community of Christ International Peace Award for his advocacy on behalf of immigrants. He's one of the founders of the Mexican American Cultural Center, and he spends a portion of his year in his parish in San Antonio. And when I heard that, I thought originally it meant he was maybe there in the fall and at Notre Dame in the spring, but we learned last night that he commutes to San Antonio every weekend to be with his parish for mass. Father Elizondo is known as the father of US Latino theology, and his scholarly interests are many, education, theology, evangelization, spirituality, culture, and public ritual. His books include The Galilean Journey, The Mexican-American Promise, The Future is Mestizo, Life Where Cultures Meet, and Guadalupe, Mother of the New Creation. He's edited and published numerous other books, articles, and video programs on faith and culture. Of the many intersections that Father Elizondo's work has with Protestant evangelical theology, one of the most striking is his theology of conversion finding new life in the midst of chaos, enslavement, and even death. This is the message of Mary's Magnificat, that the rejected of the world are chosen and beautified. Conversion, Elizondo stresses, is about Jerusalem finding Galilee. In his commentary on John Paul II's opening address at the 1979 Poebla Conference, one of the conferences where the Latin American bishops would lead the church in unchartered territory with regard to solidarity with the poor. Father Elizondo refers to the Pope's very important words, quote, the poverty of Latin America can become the evangelical poverty that will invite the rich, proud, and powerful of the world to convert to the way of the Lord who freely chose not only to be poor and lowly, but to make these very rejected ones the salt and light of the world. End of quote. Few expected these opening words. Whether the Pope left Rome in 1979 with those sentiments in mind, or instead found himself converted on the road from Mexico City to Puebla to Oaxaca, we can never know for sure. But as Elizondo remarks, God works through the devotion of the people to speak to the most powerful in the church and the world. Mestizo theology offers this very important word to the evangelical understanding of conversion. Theology is critical reflection on praxis, hope that transforms unjust and oppressive structures in this world, passion for God, 
and all people, regardless of political borders and the centrality of the laity in their devotional practices in the church's mission. I speak on behalf of North Park Theological Seminary and the Evangelical Covenant Church in saying, today is a blessed event, not only in terms of the ecumenical dialogue, but also in terms of reflecting on our shared hopes and the challenges that you, Father Alessandro, have for us. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Que sea muy bienvenido. Welcome. Thank you, Shelley. It was a distinct honor last night to have supper with a group of you, and I learned a tremendous amount, and I felt very much at home. I felt very much at home with all of you in, in your commitment, your commitment to the Lord, your commitment to bring something new, which is always the good news of the gospel, always bringing something new out of the chaos of the present. And certainly we're in the age of chaos, certainly with the relation to the immigrants. I, I don't know of any time when the immigrant question has been a great question worldwide, not just in the U.S., but throughout the world. I mean, just we here in Syria, there's over two million adults and over a million children have been displaced. Uh, we have had 3,000 a day arrive from Africa in Lampedusa to try to make their way into Europe. Uh, from Central America, from Honduras, Salvador, Nicaragua, we had the people risking their lives to come in the tree of death to come to hopefully make it to the U.S. and some even the way to Canada. So we're certainly living in a world of, of crisis. We're living in many ways. But it, Christianity is about hope. Christianity is about hope, and we can never rob our people of hope. Because this is our task, to, to really bring out the newness that in spite of what's happening, it's something new. Today I come to you basically as a priest, as a priest from San Antonio, Texas, as one who grew up in the Catholic tradition, but very, very much in the Mexican Catholic tradition which is very, very different from the U.S. Catholic tradition. I mean, someone like two worlds apart. Uh, and I grew up in that tradition, really finding a love of God, love of Jesus, love of Mary, in the very lively parish that I went to. I mean, we didn't have to have a, a, a commandment to tell us to go to Mass on Sundays. Uh, we wanted to go. There was a place to go. There was a place, actually, uh, well, as I got older, there was a place to meet the girls. So, so, so you know, you, you had different reasons for going, but, but church was something that, that you wanted to go to. Nobody had to tell you you had to go. You know, it was fun. We had processions. We had all kinds of things. We had dynamic preaching. So I, I loved being a Catholic. I loved my church. But as I grew up, you know, as I grew up and I went to the school and I found out that I that I was wondering what all the foreigners were doing in the classroom, because they were speaking some kind of funny language, which was English. Uh, I didn't know it at the time. I was totally Spanish-speaking. By the way, I, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, in a totally non-English speaking section of the city. Uh, Spanish was the only language at home and so forth. So I went to school, and I really I failed the first grade. <laughs> I used to hate school. If I hadn't had a very tenacious mother to keep me in there, I would have been an elementary school dropout as many of our kids are. Uh, but I eventually had a, a German teacher, a German teacher, German-American, who kind of just took an interest in me and just completely changed me around. Uh, all of a sudden, school became fun. All of a sudden, school became exciting. All of a sudden, and I found I could do it. But I still had, was crossing daily. I was crossing the street in San Antonio, and I was in my very comfortable Mexican side of the city. Then I'd cross the street to go to school, and it was totally foreign. Uh, the, even the church was totally different. And I, I could see why in English they had to have a commandment to, that shall keep holy the Lord's day. Because, I mean, who else would go to, go to church if it wasn't a commandment? I mean, church was boring. <laughs> you know, it was boring. We were stiff. There was always a good sister there to hit us with a ruler in case we moved out, out or something else. So I, I was navigating between the two worlds. And I kept asking myself, am, am I a Mexican or am I U.S. American? Who am I? Who am I? Do I have to quit being one to be the other? Do I have to, how can I really combine it? So this was a struggle for me, the struggle for identity, the struggle that many children of immigrants face. Not the immigrant. The immigrant knows who they are, and they know the hardships they go through and all that, but they know who they are. But the children of the immigrants don't know who they are because we're neither here nor there. Uh, and so that was my struggle. That was my struggle in school. 
And when I you know, joined the seminary and joined the church, it was the time of the civil rights movement. It was the time of the civil rights movement, the time of Vatican II. And for me, Vatican II was, uh, was the most beautiful thing ever happened to us in Catholicism. It was a real outpouring of the spirit. Uh, it was a real outpouring of the spirit. I was in seminary. I was in seminary, we had a great lecture one day. We had a professor that nobody liked, but he was a great lecturer. And, and he gave a tremendous lecture on why there would never be another ecumenical council again. It's, the bishops got together, they find papal infallibility, they handed the power over to the Pope, so he won't have to gather us again, it'll be too expensive, it's too impractical, it won't happen. And so he gave a marvelous lecture on why there would never be another ecumenical council. A week later, Pope John announced the council. <laughs> we enjoyed it to no end, he never said a word. <laughs> But the council was beautiful because it was, it was the first, John had done something before he called the council. Before he called the council, he called upon missionary bishops to resign. He said, and people said, well, the people aren't ready. People of Africa aren't ready. People aren't, you know. And he said, when are they going to be ready? You have, they're going to be ready when they are there. So he asked missionary bishops to resign in favor of naming local bishops. Uh, and therefore, by the time Vatican Council II was called, it was the first real world council we ever had. It was the first real world council who had voices from Asia, from Africa, from India, from Latin America, and so forth. And the bishops came, and to their surprise, the Pope told them, speak freely. I mean, that wasn't within Catholicism. It wasn't within the culture of Catholicism. We, we had the rule of faith and so forth. But the Council of the Pope said, speak freely. And speak, what are the needs of the modern world? Uh, Pope, Paul, uh, Pope John had two pillars that were very important for him, tradition and modernity. See, the two are not opposed. Uh, we come out of a living tradition. The church is not a museum. Uh, the church is not a museum. It's a living organism. It's the body of Christ which is growing in society. Uh, and so the church is, it has to be rooted in tradition. But tradition, like the roots of a tree, tradition produces fruit. Uh, and so the fruit is, what, what are we saying to the world today? What are we saying? What are the needs? What are the pains? What are the struggles? What are the dreams of the world today? And that became the basis of the council, tradition, modernity. Huh? And how do we, in the context of modernity, the whole question of culture became very important because now there was a world church. It was not just a European church. It was not just a colonizing church, uh, no matter what, how good the intentions had been. Uh, there was a church that had a different face, a different heart, a different mind. Uh, and, and so the whole question of culture came in that culture is a gift of God, and cultural diversity is a gift of God. So in, in that context of the spirit of the council and so forth, I myself started to ask questions of think Catholicism. Uh, for us in the U.S., uh, the Catholic priests that we had were usually from Belgium, from Ireland, mainly from Ireland, from Germany, somewhere else. Uh, and so therefore, they were very much priests according to their tradition, uh, according to the, to the, but they, they did not understand. They did not understand Mexican Catholicism. And that's why I started to, to dig in. Uh, I wasn't a theologian, and I never wanted to be a theologian. I'm a, I'm a parish priest. I love to work with the people in the grassroots um, because that's where it's at. Uh, but, I, but I started to, to try to, you know, how do, we, how do we confront these guys? How do we confront these guys that come up and tell us, what, you know, your brand of Catholicism is too superstitious, it's backwards, it's syncretism. It's all, and I knew, I knew that I had experienced the beauty of God. I knew I'd had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, you know. I knew that when people tell me, when did you meet the Lord? Well, I started to think back. I said, well, you know, I think the first time I met the Lord was when I first made my first communion. I remember being prepared, and I remember really having a real mystical experience. And so to be told all this was trash and backward and we had to get rid of this, and then we'd go into trouble. Priests from the U.S. would tell us superstitious, backward, and so forth. Then we'd get priests from Mexico come in. But once a year, they bring a priest to give a mission or something. And we get after us, oh, you're losing your Catholicism. You're becoming too Protestant-like, you know. <laughs> so, so, so we, were, we were both. We were told we were no good either side. Uh, the Anglo church were telling us we were, we were too superstitious and backwards. The Mexican priest would tell us we were losing our Catholic tradition. So who were we? So that was the beginning. It was the beginning. I was assigned in 1965 to be director of religious education for the diocese. That's another story how that came about, but it was, anyway, it came about. Uh, I was three years ordained. And so I, I realized there was nothing for, for our Mexican people. There was nothing. 
There were some few translations, but nothing that really touched the heart of who we were. So I went to Mexico City, and I pleaded my case with the director of religious education. I really pleaded my case deeply and said, you know, would you help us? Would you got to do something for us? You got to, what are you doing here? And he kind of listened to me, and he was a very Indian-looking fellow, and he just stared at me, uh, you know, stone-faced, no reaction. And I pleaded my best of my ability to pleaded my case. And at the end, he says, he looked at me and says, I'm not going to help you. Why something? because you have a different reality. I will go with you and walk with you, uh, but you have discovered what you need to do yourself because you are partly Mexican, but you're not just Mexican. Uh, you're U.S., and it was true. All my schooling had been in U.S. schools, uh, and so I was a combination. I love the U.S., but I love Mexico, but it wasn't a matter of either or. Uh, and then he took me. He took me, and this was, for me, this was real, the moment of my personal, you might say, conversion to start doing the work I've done. He took me to the Plaza de las Tres Culturas in Mexico City. I don't know if there's some of you visited Tlatelolco. Uh, and it's a beautiful plaza where you have the original uh, temples of the Aztec Empire. It was a big ceremonial site. Then you have the first colonial church right in the center. And then you have around it, you have the, the multi-rise uh, apartment buildings. So it's the Plaza of the Three Cultures, the ancient, the colonial, the modern. And they have a beautiful inscription there. They have a beautiful inscription. It says, on the sad night of August 13th, 1521, heroically taken by Cortes, valiantly defended by Cuauhtémoc, it was neither a defeat nor a victory, but the painful birth of Mexico today the mestizo people. Uh, I mean, for me, that, that was a transforming moment, uh, that I didn't have to think in terms of either or, uh, but I could think in terms of, of somehow of, of something new, something new coming out of the clash. Uh, we had been born out of the clash of Spain and Native America, but then we, we were born, myself, out of the second clash of U.S. Anglo culture and Mexican mestizo culture, and that was a total clash. But how do we pull out, out of the old, how do we pull out something new? Uh, and that became, therefore, the beginning of my work that has led to my second conference today on Galilee and Jesus. But, so we found out that we, we, to really know ourselves, we had to go into our history. We found out we didn't know our history. We didn't know anything about our evangelization. We didn't know anything about our, we, we didn't know the, the reason for our faith. We knew we had beautiful expressions, and we loved them, uh, but we, we, we didn't understand them. We didn't know what they were about. Uh, and so we were challenged, and we were helped. We had a beautiful historian from Argentina, Enrique Dussel. Some of you might have read his works. He's the most famous historian of Latin American church history. Started at the Ecumenical Association of Church Historians. And has done some marvelous work in retrieving history. Retrieving history from the unwritten sources of history. Not just from the sources, but, but retrieving history for the place we don't expect it to be. And so he kind of challenged us to, to, and we discovered ourselves that we were born, we were born out of the encounter, of the encounter, our first birth was the encounter between Europe, Spain in particular, Spain and native Mexico. Uh, and it was a birth that was both biological and sexual because there were no women came in the beginning, only men, and the men had no vow of celibacy. In fact, one of the soldiers wrote home and he, he wrote home bragging that he had fathered at least 57 children that he knew of. So there was, there was a reality. Uh, women came only later uh, and already the beginning had But it was also a spiritual birth. It was also a spiritual birth because there had been a real, a real profound synthesis, a real profound conversion of the culture itself. Uh, conversion not just being to the individual's there had been a conversion of the very culture itself. We can look back and see the effects on how it happened and so forth, but the reality is that it happened. Uh, it happened and out of that came to make some people. So we start to discover, we start looking at the two sources of who are our parents, who are our ancient parents that still live in us, as your parents live in you, as your grandparents live in you. So what, what, are, what, what are those deep sources? And we start to discover a beautiful world a beautiful word that, that the native peoples were not savages, were not backward. They were extremely well-developed, organized religious people. Uh, and it was like a clash. It was like a tidal wave of two waves coming together, two empires 
clashing together, uh, the Nahuatl Empire of Mexico and the Iberian Empire of Europe. Uh, and they're so different. Let me just share with you a few of the differences that are still existing today. For example, for the Mexican people, everything is religious. You have no separation of religious and state. You have no separation of religion and culture. Uh, religion is life and life is religion. And there you find shrines everywhere. You find images, sacred images everywhere. You, you, find, you find religion is everywhere because religion is the spice of life. Uh, in, the, in the Spanish, in the Iberian, it was very different. Uh, there were very religious people, but religion was totally separate from the secular. And therefore, you had all the issues of the sacred and the secular. Th those were the issues in late Native America. Life was religious, uh, and it was sacred. Uh, and so there was one, but a very profound difference was the whole concept, and this is the, a profound metaphysical difference between Mexico and the United States. Uh, the, Mexico operates really on an anthropology of duality. Uh, on an anthropology, we don't have either ors. We have and ands. Uh, and that's why it's very difficult today. It's very difficult today for a Mexican-American kid to take a true or false test, because they will always find an exception. Don't give a true or false, because they will only find an exception to a true or false. Uh, because that still is part of us. Uh, it, things are both, there's day and night, and there's night and day. There's beauty and ugliness, and ugliness and beauty. There's sadness and joy, and joy and sadness. Uh, it's levels, but so there is not either or, but it's some and some. Uh, God has to be male and female. That was the ultimate. Uh, how could God be God? If God is only a father God, he would not be a complete God. So God had to be male and female to be God, to be truly God. So the whole, set, the whole concept of duality is still very profound, and I'll try to show you the implication in a moment, versus the concept of the Iberian concept of metaphysics, which thinks are either or. In fact, in, in the Spanish of Spain, because of the whole Arabic presence, Spain was, Spain was the most mixed country in the world. I mean, they, they were considered the bucket of Europe. It, it caught everybody else. Uh, it had caught the Greeks, it caught the Romans, it caught the, the, the Moorish people. We, we had Islam for, for four, 800 years. Uh, so a lot of our Spanish is Islamic, even our names. Uh, I saw a poster yesterday with the name Alvarez. Well, that's the original Moorish name, Alvarez. Uh, or we have a lot of Jewish names, Benavides, Ben David, uh, and others. Because Spain was a mixture. Spain only obtained its independence in 1492. Uh, but they had this very, very absolutist mentality. Things are either or, not one or the other. Uh, and it, because of the duality, they had a beautiful way of expression, and it's very evident in the poetic memory of the Guadalupe event. Uh, everything had to be expressed in two terms. You could not express reality adequately in one term. Uh, everything had to be in two terms. For example, uh, Personality. How would you say personality? The rostro, the face, and the heart. Where is your heart? A baby is born faceless and heartless. It's a community that forms it and gives it its personality. Uh, so, so the person is face. How do you call revelation uh, in a lot of terms? You couldn't just say revelation. They wouldn't understand what you're talking about. They would say flower and songs because God is expressed ultimately in beauty. And so the, 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 supreme, the supreme spiritual person was the artist. The artist was one with a God-possessed heart uh, that, that could express the beauty of things in ways that could be seen and could be heard. The, the poet, the songwriter, the artist were the supreme spiritual persons. Uh, so this frasismos, uh, this frasismo night and day, two terms to express the ultimate. Uh, well, in, in, uh, in Spanish talk, it's absolute talk. I mean, look at the uh, philosophical distinctions that day. And uh, look at the debates went on. Things were either or. Uh, so in, in Spain, it defines, uh, in Native American thought, it's a, poet, it's a poem. Because the poem stimulates your mind to the other. Uh, a poem opens your mind. A definition closes it. Uh, so definition, by the way, are, will separate while well, the poetry will unite. So they had very much a sense of, of pictographic. They, had, they, had, they were very, very educated people, but they were not alphabetic. And that's a big distinction. They were pictographic. Uh, and the pictographic logic proceeds in a totally different way than the alphabetic logic. 
The alphabetic logic, you go from the letter to the word, to the sentence, to the paragraph, to the chapter, to the book. Uh, I was kept away last night by reading a very good book. Uh, and, and so, but you, went, you don't see the whole. You go from the, uh, in the pictographic, you see the whole first. Uh, and you see the whole first, and then you come to the details. For example, just recently, well, about, about 20 years ago, uh, they, they, they found a, a, what they call a map, which is a history, it's a, be the equivalent of a history book. And it's about this big, about this big. They found it in some latest collection. It, it, it was the, the chronology of the Nahuatl people, 400 year march, uh, totally documented in this pictographic document. Uh, the plants, the, the rainfalls, the, everything was in it. Uh, but you see the whole, and then you come to see the detail. Uh, Mexican Americans were pictographic. To this day, go to any Spanish speaking barrio, you see the murals. You see the beautiful murals because people want to see history. They don't just hear it, read it, they want to see it. Uh, it's what you see that comes into you. Uh, and so therefore you see that the whole concept of, of the icon in, in, in Mexican American theology, uh, it, the whole concept of the icon, so the pictographic communication versus the alphabetic, uh, it, the alphabetic communication. You had the concept of truth. Truth was expressed in beauty. Truth was expressed, ultimately, only a truth that comes into the heart moves you to action. Uh, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Where, where are your values? Uh, and so it's very much a religion of the heart. Uh, for, for the Spanish mind, at that period, it was rational. Uh, in fact, the most interesting thing, you've never read them, I recommend them highly to you, the, the, probably the first ecumenical dialogues. Uh, the dialogues is called Los Coloquios de los Doce. Uh, and there's a dialogue between the, the Spanish theologians and the Native American theologians. Uh, and there were dialogue. And there's a beautiful one about the third or fourth dialogue where the, the Native leaders uh, explain to the missioners, we're so grateful, you've sacrificed so much, you've crossed the ocean, you've undergone all kinds of difficulties, you've presented and so forth, they, all kinds of praises. Uh, and that's very typical Mexican language today, by the way. When somebody's really praising you, you have to be ready because they're gonna, uh, you know. <laughs> and so there's very typical, they, they, a long series, just of beautiful praises. And then, however, however, we cannot accept your doctrine. And then they go on to explain why because the doctrine of the ancestors. The ancestors are not here to answer for themselves. They are the ones that are ultimately rooted. Rootedness was essential for them. They're the ones that, are, and through them we have learned. They give us our customs, they give us our food, they give us our, they went on through a whole series of why they could not accept what the missionaries were proposing. So in the end they say, you have, you have killed our warriors, you have destroyed our cities, you have raped our women, you say our gods are dead. So why should we live? Let us die. I mean, at that level, they did not succeed. Uh, at the, that level, they not, and they were amongst the best, but they did not succeed. Uh, the community, uh, uh, for, for, for Native American, community comes first. For us, the individual comes first, the individual from community. In Latin America, the community is an existential thing. The community gives rise to the person. Uh, they're the ones that furnish the, the newborn baby who's born faceless and heartless. They're the ones that form the face and the heart. Uh, and so you're, you're existentially tied, tied, blood tied to the others. And that's the reason family is so fundamental uh, because it's a biological unit. Take for example today the sad murder, uh, the sad disaster in Fort Hood, Texas. I don't even remember the, the reason for his rage. He was refused permission to go to his mother's funeral. And that was the reason for the rage of the guy who took off and killed people and all that. Uh, and that, that was, a, I remember when we were working with the military many years ago, one of the things that they, they couldn't understand was they should grant leave to a Latino whose parents had died. Uh, because for a Latino, I remember myself in seminary, when I was in seminary, my, my grandmother died. And I went, and it was the old days, when you came to seminary, you couldn't leave, you were sequestered all the time except for Christmas and all that. So I, my grandmother died, my, they, I got the phone call, my father told me what the funeral was and so forth. I went to the dean and I asked for permission. I said, Father, can I leave? And he said, well, let me find you. He said, well, the rule says that you can leave for your immediate parent, but you cannot leave for a grandparent because that's not within the rules. So you can't go. I'm sorry, but you, you know, we're praying for your granddad and all nice things, but you can't go. 
So I went back to the telephone. We just had one telephone the whole building in those days. I went back to, I called my dad. I said, Dad, everything's okay. You can pick me up. <laughs> well, the only difference, oh, by the way, then walking out, I met the dean. And he said, oh, by the way, I talked to the rector, and he's, he's going to make an exception. You can go. Well, the only difference if permission made was I came back. That was the only difference made. I would have gone because I, there was no choice. So this, this deep sense of community, this deep sense of carnalismo, uh, who is your brother, your blood brother, and so forth. Uh, and it was very, very, and it, it went to the cosmic communion. Uh, the Nahuas had a deep sense of, of cosmic unity. Uh, and therefore, for example, we were all important and totally non-important. We, we're, it's not important because like a tiny cell, like a tiny cell to the cosmos, uh, you take a tiny cell of a vaccine, uh, you don't even see it, but it can protect you from disease. Or a tiny cell of, of a disease. Take AIDS, for example. You, you don't even see it. It's just a tiny cell, but it makes all the difference. That's, the, that's what we are to the cosmos, to the cosmic quarter. We are totally non-important and yet totally important because we make all the difference in the world. Uh, so we are, are an organic unity, uh, an organic unity. Uh, for, for, the, for the Spanish world, it's highly individualistic. I mean, if you're into Spain, if you're into Spain, you know, the, the Spanish of Spain is very, very different from that of Colombia or Ecuador or Mexico or any other place. Uh, in Spain, you, you hear everything like a first sergeant yelling a command at you, siéntate, levántate. You know, they're giving commands at you, you know, and that's the way they speak. Uh, that's the way they speak. But, but in, in Latin America, no te gustaría sentarte un ratito, you know, would you like to sit down? I remember being in Colombia one time and, and it was coffee break. And these young ladies were bringing about trays with coffee. And it came to us, and a group of priests were there. And she said it this way. I'll, I'll try to remember it, and they'll translate. Si me pudiera permitir una pequeña impertinencia, me atrevería a provocarles a vuestras reverencias con un tinto. You know? <laughs> she wouldn't say, would you like a cup of coffee? But she said, if I would dare to allow myself a small impertinence, I would dare to provoke your reverences with a cup of coffee. Uh, that's a, a beautiful way. Uh, but Latin American Spanish is melodious. Uh, Latin American Spanish is basic poetic. Uh, Latin American Spanish really incorporates all this ancient Nahuatl background and other Latin American backgrounds to where it's very personal. Um, I remember translating letters for my archbishop, and a letter would come from a nun in Mexico, and it would be about a two or three page letter. Uh, and I always get this letter to translate and summarize. That was all the point. It, because my archbishop would never read any letter beyond one page. So the, the, so the letter would start, you know, um, you know, kissing the sacred cloth of the mantle of the successor of the apostles that wears the sacred purple and so forth and so on. And all, it would go through all kinds of theological. And, and then what they wanted to do was meet with the archbishop. Uh, so I could summarize it in one sentence. She'd like to meet with you, you know. <laughs> you know? Uh, but because then, but see that, but that's the way it's, it, it's very, because the language expresses a mentality. Uh, the language expresses a way, a way of life, a way of, a view of life. And so there's very, very cosmic unity versus the individual mind. Where the Spanish is, is the aventurero that goes off into to conquer. And Wherever the cruelty and all that happened, you had to admire the Spanish conquistadores. God, how they made their way from Florida to Texas, how they made their way from Mexico City to New Mexico, how they made their way. The, the missionary to, uh, to Texas was Martil de Jesus. He was equally a missionary to Guatemala, and he would go from, from Texas to Guatemala barefooted because they could not even ride a donkey. That was against the vow of poverty. Uh, and, and so this highly individualistic heroism you go off alone and you conquer, uh, and you conquer. And you, so then you had a, something that was very similar exteriorly. Both the Native Americans are highly ritualistic. Uh, it's the ritual that, that, that communicates life to each other. Uh, in ritual, the group becomes one. Uh, and if you've been to a Native American dance in New Mexico, I don't know if you have them here somewhere, it, it's beautiful to see when the, when the drums began beating, the common heartbeat, uh, the people start falling in, and there's just a sense of oneness, of the unity. The rituals bring about a unity. I know 
when I was at the cathedral, I really promoted these popular rituals. And I was always amazed. I was always amazed at the participation of the people. Um, on Good Friday, we, we had our big Good Friday service, and it was beautiful. We had the, the, the Mexican style of Good Friday. It was, I was telling them last night, our liturgy for Good Friday is 12 hours. You know, we start at 10 and we we'll go till 10. But you go in and out. You know, you don't stay in all the, all the time. But, and this large participation, we average about, nowadays, about 30,000 people show up for the Good Friday service. Uh, but but, but the, the sense that you can see in their faces, uh, there's a sense of where they have expanded their personal space to where they, they, they're interconnected with the other. Uh, and you see all kinds of people, rich and poor, black, white, yellow, every color, every ethnicity, every class, and there's a unity. Uh, there's a profound sense of unity in the ritual. Uh, and, and so the, they were very ritualistic. And the Spanish, the Spanish are very, very ritualistic. Uh, they may be totally separate, secular and civil, but they're totally ritualistic. If you've ever been to Sevilla in Holy Week, and if you haven't been, I recommend that you go sometime. Uh, it, it's unbelievable. Uh, they, may, they may be communists, they may be sec atheists and all that, but come, come Holy Week, they participate in the rituals. Uh, there's something to ritual, the public ritual that, that really comes from the heart of the people. Not something that you have to do, but something from an inner must, uh, that inner must that drives you, not because there's a law, but because there's a profound desire, that need to be connected with others. And so that sense of public ritual is very, very important, both in the Spanish and then, and here, there's a very interesting, for me, for me, the very interesting anthropological thing. In the Indian world, God had to be male and female. God could not just be male. He wouldn't be a complete God. The Spanish mind is very interesting. The Spanish had a devotion to the Dama de Balzac, where before, before Christianity came on the scene. Uh, and that devotion was tr transposed, transformed into devotion to the Blessed Mother. Uh, so you always have in Spain, you always have the unity, the bond between the mother and the child. We have in, in, in Spanish Catholicism, los sagrados corazones, this, not just the sacred heart of Jesus, the sacred hearts, uh, because it's in the bond, it's in the bond between the two that salvation takes place. Uh, it's in the bond between the mother and the child. Uh, Therefore, in the processions in Sevilla, you have the beautiful procession, you have a, a float to one of the aspects of the Passion, then you have a float to Mary. Uh, always the two, uh, not just one or the other. Uh, and, and so this kind of transferred to Latin America. So one thing that was very interesting in the two, and it's hard for us to comprehend, but in Native America, the need for human sacrifice, that was something that was incomprehensible to us. Uh, and it was scandalous to the Spaniards that came. How could anybody that was so sophisticated, so well-developed, so advanced in so many ways, practice human sacrifice? When you study their logic, you know, it's not to approve it, but to understand it. Uh, you don't have to approve of things to understand them, but to be able to understand them from within. Uh, for them, human sacrifice was something very profound. It was for the salvation of humanity. You had to, you had to nourish the sun with that which was most precious, and that which was most precious was that mysterious, the mysterious liquid called blood. And so unless you, 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 you were nourishing the sun, the sun would cease to exist and we'd all perish. So for them, it was a sense of, of cosmic salvation that they practiced human sacrifice. The Spaniards came in, were totally scandalized by that. But what they didn't realize, the natives were equally totally scandalized at the little respect the Europeans had for life, that they did not hesitate to kill each other directly in battle. And so they were on the basis of killing was the mutual scandal, uh, the mutuality of scandal. We, sometimes we see the scandal of one and we don't see the scandal of ourselves. Uh, and so how, how they, they were scandalized at the, mission, at the Europeans, the Europeans scandalized at the natives on the basis of human sacrifice. But those two worlds came clashing together. Uh, those two worlds came clashing together and there were two Europes that came. Uh, there was Europe of the conquistador which sought the good life and it's still part of the tensions of Latin America. The very, very small elite, powerful and rich, and the great masses of the people. Um, that came with the conquest. Uh, that came with the conquest. But for the people, uh, that, that, there was a coming together, and for the church in Spain, it was a pre-Reformation. It was a pre-Reformation Catholicism. 
Uh, and the church in Spain was already beginning its biblical reformation. Already Cardinal Francisco de Cisneros uh, was intent on, on going back to the sources, going back to the biblical sources, going back to the Bible itself. Uh, and he already started the University of Alcalá, where biblical studies were being promoted. He published the famous sexagon, the language in different, the Bible in different languages. Uh, so it was a real emphasis on the Bible and a real emphasis on the renewal, the renewal of religious life in the clergy, uh, already beginning already before the Reformation. So he insisted that, that when, when the New World was started, the New World was a theological term. It was a theological term based on the writings of Joaquin de Flor, which predicted the Third Age. Now, we lived the age of Jesus, we lived the age, the age of the Father was the Old Testament, the age of Jesus, and now we're going to live the age of the Spirit. And for him, this was going to be now the age of the Spirit. This was going to be now the new Christianity. The new Christianity was going to be purged of, of all the defects of the European Christianity. He was very, very negative on the European church. In fact, when the missionaries came over, the first missionaries to come over officially were 12 in number. That number remind you of anything? Twelve. The, the, in fact, they had, they had a, a carving, a beautiful carving of the twelve being led by the mystical Francis coming with a beer carrying, carrying this upon their shoulders. What do you think they were carrying? The Vatican. Uh, the Vatican was going to come to America. This is going to be now the seat of the new humanity. This is going to be now the seat of the new church. Uh, this is going to be side of this. So that's why I meant it was a biological birth. It was a spiritual birth. Uh, the missionaries thought every, they, were, they were marvelous men. They made their mistakes. But I choose to look at the positive. I choose to look at the positive they brought about. Uh, and we had people like Pedro de Gant, Peter of Gant. He was a Belgian missionary. Uh, and he was marvelous. He was a lay brother. And, and he insisted that you had to learn the language. And the only way you could learn the language, they didn't have any dictionaries. They didn't have any language schools. I mean, now what was a completely different mindset. Uh, it, so, so how would they learn it? Well, he started going to play with the kids. He would roll in the sand with them. He spent two or three years, his fellow Franciscan thought he'd gone crazy. Uh, he'd gone crazy or something. Because he, he's, he's playing with the kids. But he, he allowed the children to become his teachers. Uh, that was beautiful. He allowed the children. And he's the first one to really kind of penetrate, penetrate the novel culture. Uh, and this is when it started the, the transfiguration of the symbolic world of the culture. And, and that's where the conversion of the culture took place. Uh, for example, um, he started the idea that human sacrifice was horrible, but they were good people. But now, now their human sacrifice is no longer necessary because now the divine human had sacrificed himself for us. Now that we are saved through the blood of the cross, and so now, and so on, on the altars of sacrifice, he implanted the crucifix uh, with all the main symbols of the passion because now the divine human sacrifice had taken over. Uh, and he transformed the, the sacrifice of the cross became one of the main elements, uh, the suffering of Jesus being one of the main elements of the conversion. And he transformed their festivals. I mean, the Indians needed festivals. And how else can you teach them about the New Testament, which is about an experience, Fundamentally, the Bible is about an experience of people that then gets reflected upon. Well, they had to have the experience. Yeah. So he, he created evangelical place, evangelical place where people would be brought in to actually live the experience. Uh, and then they would catechize. Uh, then they would, he took the hymns and gave the hymns a Christian twist. Uh, just put in a little Christian twist and use them for Christianity so the hymns would evangelize. Because he caught on. He called on that, that for the native Mexicans, music, good music was more important than the best of sermons. Uh, and so to have good music was more important than the best of catechesis, the best of sermons. So therefore the hymns uh, and the murals, if you go to any of the early churches in Mexico, you'll find a complete catechesis visually, uh, visually in the symbolism. Uh, it's in, and the church itself, uh, the church itself had to be the most beautiful building in the village, beauty. Beauty was an element of evangelization. And so the church itself had to be built upon the model, the model of the reconstructed temple of Ezekiel. Uh, and so you find all the early churches are single nave, uh, single nave, and they have a beautiful garden plaza in front because it's paradise. You walk through paradise into the new temple, to the new Jerusalem. Uh, 
uh, because this was now the, the new temple of the Spirit. Well, all this reality, all these beautiful efforts that were being made were falling upon deaf ears in the beginning. It wasn't until 1531, 10 years after the conquest, the most painful years probably in Mexican history, the most painful years where the deaths were growing because of, of, um, of the seas and so forth. It, 10 years later, we have the events of Our Lady Guadalupe, which is a fascinating event in church history. I don't know of any event that has brought about more conversions. Uh, and there can be many explanations, but the fact remains. Uh, her devotion started a process where now the natives could understand. Uh, because here was now something in their language. I contend Guadalupe is the gospel in native terms. Uh, to understand the Guadalupe narrative properly is to understand the gospel uh, in native terms. Uh, and that's why it became so powerful. Uh, it became the gospel. And so the, uh, the Guadalupe appeared in 1531 and really brought about because Juan Diego, I mean, you had now the conversion the conversion of Juan Diego from being a you know, poor, stupid Indian and so forth, all the, the negative stereotypes, to being able to say, I'm human. Uh, it was a conversion to humanity. Uh, that's the conversion of Christ. Uh, the conversion to come out of the depths of what you are and to be able to affirm, I'm human before God and before others. I'm not inferior, I'm not inferior or superior, I'm, but I'm human. Uh, the basic humanity of the Gospels. And so he, he converted that, and the conversion of the bishop, and the conversion of the bishop is beautiful because the bishop has to be converted from being the supreme authority, the, the, the one that came to teach. I teach, you listen. That was the old concept of a teacher, uh, even in seminaries and schools. The professor taught, we learned. And the bishop was the supreme teacher. But now the bishop has to convert. He has to listen to the voice of the poor. He has to listen. He has to come build a church uh, where no church is being built in the barriada of the poor people. Uh, so there's a beautiful mutuality of conversion of Juan Diego to be able to stand and say, I'm human, uh, for the bishop to listen, uh, to listen and to kneel and to ask for forgiveness uh, because he had not listened, uh, to become a listening church, one that's really going to listen to the pains and struggles of the people. So that is the mutuality of conversion. And, and then the whole story, it just, Guadalupe begins with beautiful music and it ends with beautiful flowers. Uh, so you have here the two poles of a revelation. Uh, it's like when we, in, in Catholic religion, when we finish reading the scriptures, we put the book and say, the word of God. Well, she's saying word of God. Uh, she's saying through, through music and flowers. Uh, and so that becomes, and the two main symbols of Christianity will become our Lady with Lupe, the main icons, and Jesus Nazareno, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, in, in Mexican Christianity, Mexican Christology, you always find the suffering Christ. And it's at that moment of suffering in the Good Friday processions where the people spontaneously acclaim him El Señor del Poder, the God of power. The God of, the, the, at the moment when he's most powerless is when the greatest power comes through, uh, the Lord of power in the passion, uh, in the passion and death of Christ. So, we, so, so those become the two main aspects of, of evangelization. And evangelization proceeded in a very creative way in a very creative way through ritual, song, beauty, and catechesis. What happened in Mexican Catholicism, this is my own judgment, I might be wrong, uh, the, the traditions continued, continued beautifully, traditions, the songs, the music, but there was no catechesis. There was no catechesis to accompany the process. Uh, so in time, it did become ritualistic. In time, time the, it did become sacramentized. Uh, it be, be, but, but yet the seeds were still there. When I went to the cathedral, my whole was to revive, to revive and bring the biblical meaning of what they were celebrating. And I have to tell you, the response was beyond imagination. People loved hearing it. This is what we've been practicing uh, in the posadas, the pastorelas, the via cruces. So those are main icons. And Flori Canto today remains a very, very strong sense. But the way we personalize religion is interesting. Uh, you notice in Spanish names, uh, names that we don't translate to. For example, Trinidad. That's a common in their first name, Trinity. Uh, Mysterios, mysteries. Uh, Incarnacion, incarnation. Uh, santos, saints. You know, they're, they're, we, we personalize religion. Jesus, uh, you, don't, you don't call somebody Jesus in English. You call him Christ or Chris or something else. But in Spanish, very, and you call girls Jesusita. Uh, it, it's both a male and a female name. 
Jose Maria, Joseph and Mary. You would personalize. Christianity in Latin America is a personal uh, religion of the heart. It's communitarian, but it's personal of the heart. And it's through the popular rituals today. But today what's new, what's new for, throughout Latin America, and I think there's many factors for this, you know, what's, is the love of the Bible. Today what's really new in Christianity is the love of going directly to the scriptures. Uh, and we find Bible groups, we find charismatic groups, we find prayer groups in Catholicism, in Protestantism, independence. The people have a tremendous love for the Bible. This has been something new for us uh, because it had not existed in the original period of evangelization. So what is the challenge today? I think the challenge today is for our Holy Father keeps calling for a new synthesis. Uh, his favorite word in the latest exhortation was to create a new synthesis. Uh, as peoples come together, as religions come together, I think we're called upon to, to find a new way of, of viewing humanity, to find a new way of viewing our national identities. I think, for example, the church today is a church of churches. Uh, it's a community of communities, of people coming together to enrich each other's lives. Uh, I think the church is, I think we have the truth, but I think it's like a big puzzle. Every piece, every piece of the puzzle is true, but only when you put them together do you get the whole face of, of, the, of the puzzle. And to me, God is that puzzle. God is that puzzle. And the religions of the world, the great religions and the smaller sections within a religion, all have some truth in them. And how can, how can we discover that truth? Uh, how can we in Christianity who believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life present them in such a way, in such a way that will be attractive, in such a way that will be joyful, in such a way that that will be beautiful? Uh, because beauty attracts, joy attracts. Uh, so it, so what, how can we live that beauty uh, that finds its beauty in responding to the needs of the poor, of the immigrant, of the stranger, of the forgotten, of the ex-prisoner, the ex-jailed, uh, the ex-prostitute? How do we reach out to those in further need? Because that is our ultimate beauty. Our ultimate beauty is to see beauty and dignity where others do not see it. Uh, that was the way of Jesus. And that's what I'll treat the next conference. But to, so how do we go out of ourselves uh, and to discover that there's joy in that? It's not like you go out with a sour face, and, oh, God, i got to do that again, you know? No, but, but you find joy and beauty in it because it's there. So I, I think today we're called upon to, to really live out our foundational our foundational identity and mission. What is our baptismal identity? What, is that, what does it mean that we are part of a new creation? Uh, let me give you just an example of, of something that I, I did, and it, it was during the First World War, and I used to do a lot of crazy things. I was rector of the cathedral, and I had a bishop that would allow me to do all that. So uh, the First World War, you know, I said, you know, here we're fighting religions. We've got religions fighting each other. I think the ultimate sacredness of this country, the ultimate sacredness of our country, is that we really believe religions can coexist together in the same space and work together for the common good. So I organized a common prayer service at the cathedral on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, Thanksgiving Day is a day sacred to all of us in the U.S., but it's not a sacred to any one religion. So I invited a Hindu, I invited a Muslim to do the opening prayer, I invited a Hebrew to, to pray from their scriptures. Uh, I invited an Episcopalian priestess, so we'd have a women priestess present. Uh, I invited a, a Catholic, a Native American, and Buddhist monks. Each one was to pray from three to maximum five minutes from the original text, and just to pray. No sermons, just a prayer together, you know. But we had, we had, we had oh, pardon me. The, it, it's the Pope calling again. <laughs> I had to tell him to wait. <laughs> no. Well, he might, he might be calling. <laughs> so anyway, we, we had this beautiful service. And at the end of the service, I'll never forget two comments. One was from a little viejita, a little Mexican lady. She had her veil on, and she was praying the rosary in the front pew and had a very angered looking, too, you know, just very serious looking. And she called me aside. Padre, que habla con usted? You know, kind of you know, something wrong here. Said, Father, I want to speak to you. I said, well, Father, I said, you know, in my home, I have a beautiful painting of the Last Supper in my, in my dining room. Today, I had the experience we were at the Last Supper at the end of time. I'd, and the other comment came from, from the wife of the rabbi. 
So, you know, sitting here in this church with the arches and everything else and just listen, seeing each other, this unity, because we're praying for what we desire will be, will be, but realize it's not yet. The tension that comes in prayer. We pray for what is, but it's not yet, but it has been promised. So, you see, you know, today I had the, I had the profound feeling we we're the ones in Noah's ark, ready to begin a new humanity. And I think that's what we're about. I think all of us who love Christ and we know that we must go constantly beyond ourselves, constantly beyond ourselves to, to, to find that love, the love of God among all human beings. And it's love that's going to be a driving force. Uh, it's love that's going to drive all of us to see beyond, to see newness, to see beauty, to see, to see potential where others see danger, to see the light where others see darkness. And so I think that's our mission, and I think it, it's our mestizo Catholicism. It, it's a unity of differences to provide something new. Uh, and in that newness, we find Christianity. So I think I've, I don't know what time I'm supposed to stop. Is it about time? Good. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to go into Jesus of Nazareth afterwards. But thank you very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for our live viewers, um, if you have questions, submit, do so through the YouTube version, comment section. All right, and we'll receive those. So, first question. Jesse Letourneau, third year MDiv. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you talked a little bit about the difference, differences between East and West. And in the West, we rely on apologetics and theology to make sure the traditions are held and that we don't slide into heresy. In the Mexican-American theology, what is it that you guys use to make sure that heresy doesn't become part of the faith? Well, you know, I don't think we worry too much about it. Uh, <laughs> To, to, to be honest, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't think that people uh, are too concerned about the doctrines. I think they simply, uh, you know, believe uh, very strongly, very strongly in, in Jesus, in the way of Jesus. And I, I think that's where it's really at. Uh, and I really say seriously, I, I don't think doctrinal purity or heresy has ever really entered my mind. You know, I, 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 think, I think when you, at least for me, and as a priest, I've been a priest 50 years now, and, and I, I loved it. You know, I've had ups and downs like anybody else, but it's been great. Uh, it just leading people to Jesus, to the Gospels, you know. I think the heresies are, are a question of definition and words. You know, I think, I think doctrine is a service. I think doctrine is necessary. But I see doctrine as, as guarding the, the staircase so you don't fall off. But, it, but, it, but it's not the stairs themselves. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a better example, uh, maybe the plastic bag that you put the food in to put into the freezer. The plastic bag protects it, but it's not the food you feed people. Uh, it's the food that you, and it's the gospel we feed people, you know, and the plastic bag protects it. So I think we have to see the doctors in that sense that, that they are important. They are important to, to safeguard, to safeguard, safeguard uh, from going too far out. 
And that used to mean that it's, I understand the history of, of heresies, a good idea that went too far out, you know. And so I think that's the, the way I've seen them. But I've seen that with the ordinary people. Uh, heresy, I mean, it's not a question, you know. They're on track on loving Lord Jesus, and that's the main thing. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Rachel Drakowski, a third-year MDiv student. My question has to do with your illustration of the church as a puzzle and each piece bringing something unique. What do you say is the unique piece that the Mexican-American church brings? What, pardon me, I didn't quite understand. What is the unique thing that the Mexican-American church brings? I think the, the unique thing is to, our two main icons. I think the two main icons that define us as Mexican Catholics or Mexican Christians, or I think two main icons are, you know, the, the uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the entire Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, I'll, I'll mention the next talk, how the two main icons of, of Christ for us are the two most vulnerable moments, uh, the baby in the crib and Jesus on the cross. Uh, and they're the two moments when Jesus is the most vulnerable, but that's the two moments when it's the most powerful. Uh, and I, I think that, that a defining moment. We read the devotion to El Niño Jesús. Uh, it's very, very powerful in Latino Catholicism. And therefore, our Christmas season, uh, we celebrate the pre-Christmas season, which normally in American church, uh, we technically celebrate Advent, but we don't really pay much attention to Advent, to be honest. Uh, we, we have the posadas, the nine days of, of parades and so forth. And then we have the whole Christmas season uh, of the arrival of the Magi, for example. And we go on to February 2nd, and the presentation of the child Jesus in the temple. So it, it's a major moment uh, when Jesus is most vulnerable. The other moment is Good Friday, a Good Friday when, when Jesus becomes the Lord of power. So I, I think those two are really, and I'd say the third element would be uh, the popular devotions of people. Uh, and I define popular devotions in this way, not any practice, not any practice is popular devotion. I mean, I, I had all kinds of Popular devotions come up to me, and I didn't quite understand them. But uh, I consider the main ones those that have been celebrated for a long period of time uh, across generations. Two, those are celebrated spontaneously by the greater majority of the people. And third, those which are celebrated with the clergy, without the clergy, or in spite of the clergy. Uh, the, the, those are the popular devotions. Uh, and those are the ones where I feel that there's an element uh, of the locus theologicus. I, I think there's an element there where, where we search for the voice of God. Because the, if God has a preferential option for the poor, then the poorest expression of God are privileged locus theologicus. Uh, and, and I think that that's a place where, where theology needs to be today. Uh, in, in the popular expressions of the faith where God is alive and where God is speaking to the people. And I find those very, very rich. Again, not any male devotion is. I mean, somebody has a devotion to the right toe of Jesus. Oh, you know, that's just a personal thing. But, but what is the, the devotion of the people? Thank you. Up here. Thank you, Father. Uh, Chris Hoskins, MDiv student. I have a question about in the story of Guadalupe in the narrative, there's a simultaneous conversion of Juan Diego and the bishop. I was wondering in the, in the continued narrative, how does the bishop then um, call others of the clergy into conversion themselves? Uh, is that recorded or how, yeah. how do you see that play out in history? <laughs> that, that's, there's a, in Guadalupean studies, there's a lot of controversy because of the silence of the bishop. In any of the historical documentation that we have, uh, the bishop never speaks about Guadalupe. Uh, not Bishop Sumarraga. He was the one, the actor with Juan Diego. Uh, there's reasons for that. One is that at that moment, uh, he was the main uh, zealot, really, to wipe out the Indian religions. And so it could have provoked, it could have provoked an Indian revolt. Uh, so there's reasons why maybe he didn't want to refer to it. The reason why he, he, he wouldn't want the, the, the authorities to learn about it. Uh, there's also, a, a lot of his documentation was lost. A lot of the historical documentation was burning in some fire at the 
uh, Museo de las Indias in Seville. And so we have a large area there where we simply don't know. We don't know, we don't know from written documentation what the response of the bishop immediately was. It was a second archbishop, Montufar, who recognized the devotion, recognized the big following of the devotion, and therefore ordered an inquest. We had the first inquest into Guadalupe, a canonical inquest where people were questioned and people actually testified where they remember their grandparents telling them about it and so forth. But that's the first documentation that we have. Uh, we have a documentation from Saagun, who is the earliest historian, ethno-historian. Uh, he, his works were so controversial at the time that they were actually confiscated by the Vatican and were not only published in recent times because he wrote a real magnificent ethno-history uh, of Mexico. And he makes a mention of Guadalupe in a negative sense. He tells the, the newly arriving missionaries not to have anything to do with it uh, because she's just a resurrection of Tonantzin uh, because Tepeyac was the site uh, where, where the, Native Mer the natives venerated uh, an aspect of the mother goddess, Tonantzin. And so he was afraid there was going to be a confusion uh, of the two. So the earliest documentation we have is really negative. Uh, but what we do have is the growing devotion of the people. Uh, and, then, and then eventually the clergy also. And, and that just grew. Like I said, the first, the first recognition was by Bishop Montufar, who was the second archbishop. Uh, and maybe there was a nil rivalry there. Uh, Sumara was a Franciscan, and Montufar was a Dominican. So it might have been the real jealousy there. <laughs> if I don't answer your question, just ask me again, because huh? uh, I ramble around. And, and Good morning. I am Pierre Restrepo, uh, yeah. missionary. Um, you said that because there was no Catholicism, people fell into ritualism. And then you said, but now we are into a new era where people are loving the scriptures. How is that happening? How is that taking place? In many ways, <laughs> in many ways. Bible courses, Bible reading groups, prayer groups, uh, it's, it's many, many different, they're just a love for the Bible. And this has come across all of Catholicism. Vatican II, Vatican II for us was a reclaiming of the Bible. Up until Vatican II, the Protestants had the Bible, we had the catechism. Uh, and so, I mean, I remember being told, don't go to the Bible, it's confusing. Uh, don't go to the Bible, the, the church has enough doctors to interpret it for you. Uh, go to the catechism, and they'll tell you what it says. Uh, I grew up with that mentality. We had a beautiful Bible at home. It was never open. <laughs> you know, it gathered dust there, you know. And so Vatican II for us was a tremendous rediscovery in Catholicism worldwide. It was a tremendous rediscovery of the Bible. Uh, and it's a tremendous rediscovery, therefore, of the biblical basis uh, of, of our tradition and who we are. And so that has come really, but it's really caught fire in Latin America. It really, the Comunidades de Base, the Grupo de Oración, the este, Ministro de la Palabra, all the different ministries and the different evangelical groups. I mean, there's really been a fire set up. And it's a fire this, in this country. In this country, the, the Latino evangelical groups, both Catholic and Protestant evangelical groups, are multiplying, and, and they're fascinating. You know, so the people just have just developed like, like they were waiting for that. You know, when Vatican II came and said, "Let's do it, let's go with it." Yes, I myself remember in my second parish, I was assigned to do a course in, in for the teachers of catechism. I was ordained two years, I think, and I, I was already Mr. Vatican II. I, I was in love with all the documents, and especially the document on divine revelation on the Bible. So they wanted me to teach the catechism, and I couldn't teach it. I, I said, no, I'm going to teach, I'm going to prepare a course myself, you know, and I, I'm going to take a course from biblical sources. So I was teaching a course, and I was mimeographing notes, and I had a very scrupulous pastor, and he kept saying, no, no, Father, you need to get an imprimatur. And I thought, I'm senior. If anything, I, I'm violating, violating copyright laws. He said, no, 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 you've got to get an imprimatur. You've got to get an imprimatur. So finally, I put all my notes together. Uh, and they're very simple notes, just taken to Genesis and, and then, the, you know, the prophets and all this kind of stuff. And I, and I sent it to the archbishop with a letter, you know, saying I was trying to implement Vatican II. And I quoted several places. And I wanted his corrections and his advice and his permission. Well, I didn't hear anything for about six months. 
And about six months, I get this letter. And in those days, we were all afraid. When we got a letter from the archbishop, he just kind of, you know, didn't, I was so scared I didn't want to open it for the whole day. You know, finally, I opened it in the evening, and the letter was appointing me the director of religious education for the diocese. So that was my start of getting into religious education. It was really, really initiating for the diocese then, for the diocese initiating the first course in biblical catechesis to where we started with the curriculum, with the fundamental curriculum, and build up on it. And I still have the notes somewhere. I can't find them, but I wish I could. But I know they're somewhere. It's a very simple program. Um, but it was the beginning of the biblical catechism, and that was kind of before its time, so, in, in Catholicism. So one of the things that Justo Gonzalez um, says to Protestants is that we should not forget our Catholic roots. So as a Catholic Latino theologian, what would you say for advice or encouragement to the Protestant Christians? Well, I think, you know, Justo and I have worked together a lot, and I have the greatest respect for him. Uh, he used to call himself a Catholic Protestant. They called me a Protestant Catholic. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> I, I, where I think we can learn from the evangelicals, especially, but the Protestant traditions, is the love of Scripture. There's no doubt that's been central to Protestantism and the evangelical movement. And I think there we can learn from, from the fire and the spirit and all that. I think where, where Protestantism can learn from, from us is the power of popular rituals that they're, they're, they're really profound expressions of faith, and not to oppose them. I, I think really we can, we can find a common ground in, in, the, in the expressions of people, and I think that's what Protestantism needs to come in, and I think the two can come together. I think that's part of the, of the new ecumenism that's coming. N none of us are gonna formulate it. It's gonna happen, uh, it, because the spirit is pushing us that way. Uh, and it, so so I, I think that that's where I see a mutuality. I, I, I see the people, uh, I, I just see the love that people have for those traditions. You know, they're profound and they're beautiful. Uh, the tradition, for example, of the Day of the Dead in, in Mexican Spanish, Dia de los Muertos, is really the day of ultimate life, where you really celebrate, where you really celebrate that death has not ended life. Uh, death has merely been the, the end of the, of, of the journey to the fullness of life. And so you, you, you go to the morning of death, but then you go to the celebration of life. You know, and that's why, for example, in, in Latin American newspapers, you find ads in the newspaper celebrating the fifth anniversary of some, some, or the tenth anniversary or the fifteenth anniversary, because we celebrate that moment. Uh, and so I think, therefore, the, the, the Day of the Dead is something to 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 really celebrate uh, the gift of eternal life. Uh, and you know, in in the Mexican tradition, they said that every, every person dies three times. Have you ever heard that? It's a beautiful saying in the Nahuatl tradition. You die, no matter how well prepared you are, the moment you die. I mean, and that you don't have words for. I know when my mother died, I, we, I dealt with death all the time and all that. When my mother died, it was different. It just hit me in the gut, you know, and I know she had to go. She was 90 years old, but death number one. You never complete or it could be accidental. Death number two, when they return the body to the womb of Mother Earth. And you know, in funerals, I as a priest, I still like in funerals to lower the body. I like to lower the body and put the, put the dirt in. You know, it, it's, a, it's a painful ritual, but it, it puts closure. It puts closure. Uh, so I really like death number two. Death number three, the absolute definitive death beyond which there's no life anymore. And there's no one around to remember me. Uh, and so therefore, loved ones will not experience absolute death. Uh, and in Christ we add that's eternal life uh, because we remember each other, the communion of saints. Uh, and, and so I think those rituals are profound, profound rituals, but to bring out the meaning of them, see, not just to practice them, to bring out the meaning of them and the theological meaning, that, that, that's what I mean by, by the ongoing catechesis and evangelization. Uh, we, we've had the treasures, but we didn't know we had treasures put it that way. Uh, I, I think you had a question in the back. Uh, yes, this is from one of our um, online um, uh, observers. At, his name is Joe Morrow. He's a 
North Park alumnus and also a pastor. My question is, I'm wondering if Father Elizondo believes the pictographic, poetic, and the and and language of Mexican Christianity speaks better to the reality of post postmodern West and to U.S. young people, I guess, versus older modes of modernity? You know, I, I think it does. I have made no study of this. I think he might have an answer here. Uh, I, I, I think it does. I find that the, the poetic, for example, when you go to poetry festivals today, they're massive. Uh, I mean, they're massive. I mean, poetry just unravels the mind. You know, and, and, and I, I think we've been so zeroed in on definition, but Jesus was poetic. I mean, the parables are beautiful. You know, they, they're really a poetic message. You know, and talking about image language, Jesus was beautiful in image language. I, I, I really think, uh, this is not pride, in, but I really think that the Mexican anthropology is much closer to the biblical anthropology uh, than the Anglo-Saxon model has been, you know, or the Spanish model. You know, I really feel that the whole emphasis on the heart, for example, uh, I think is very scriptural. You know, and so I... I I simply, that's what I feel, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in it, uh, but I, I feel that the Mexican anthropology of, of the visual, uh, the sensual, you know, the sensual in the best sense of, of in, involving all the senses, uh, it, it's, it's beautiful, a way of expressing the, the scriptures. It, it doesn't mean, you know, that, that clarity cannot help. Uh, I think, I think in, in my, and, and mentality, I, I, I don't, you know, say this, this, but not that. I really think the two can help each other. You know, I think the two can enrich each other. We can become better for it. You know, that's where I think we have a lot to learn. I didn't touch it. We have a lot to learn by being in the U.S., uh, by becoming, you know, Americanized, but we don't have to lose our, the best. I contend this in my, my, my own study of myself and, and mestizaje. You know, if we could keep the best of the Mexican tradition and pick out the best of the North American Anglo-Saxon traditions, we'd have winners. The tragedy is that we often lose the best and pick up the worst, and, that, and then we become losers. That's where you find in the gangs a lot of this stuff, and it's sad, because it is happening. Huh? But to be able to, to, to maintain the best of the two, it's a winning situation. To, to lose the best of one and pick up the worst of the other <laughs> doesn't work. End up in jail or gang or something else. Well, we look forward to Father Alessandro's um, second lecture, which will begin at 10.45 here. Um, but now we welcome you to join us for coffee in Olsen Lounge. Um, but first, join me in thanking Father Alessandro for... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, and welcome back to the second session of our NIVAL lecture with Father Virgilio Elizondo uh, from the University of Notre Dame. If you missed the first lecture, Father Elizondo did a wonderful job speaking about the cultural and religious aspects of the Mexican Christianity, and particularly the Mexican-American uh, experience, and opening up for the second lecture in which he will address the Galilean Jesus. So join me in welcoming Father Elizondo back. Thank you very much for returning. <laughs> 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 I wasn't sure if I was going to have a packed audience or empty seats. Uh, no, it's a pleasure being with you, and I'm really just honored to be here again. And not to share a few insights that, that I've come to. In, you know, I, I, I never intended to be an academic. That was not within my plans. I was doing ministry, and I organized the Mexican American Cultural Center and was really digging into our history, into our church practices, and all this stuff. And a French theologian, actually, um, he was a friend of mine already. Uh, in fact, we're coming back from the Medellin meeting in 68, and that's where we met on a plane. Uh, the Archbishop sat by the window, praying his bravery. I sat in the middle, and Jack sat on the aisle. And Jack and I drank Manhattans, and the Archbishop prayed his bravery. <laughs> and that brought the inspiration. And he kind of got after me as we were going along uh, that I had to get a doctorate. He said, you know, you're not going to be believable if you don't have that piece of paper. In a way, it means nothing. In a way, it means everything. So you really got to go get a doctorate. Well, I didn't know where to go, and if, you know, I struggled around. I was working at Mach, doing a lot of research there. But then it finally opened the door for me to, to study in, in Paris. And I think I was excited about living in Paris more than getting a doctorate. <coughs> <laughs> but, but it was a marvelous opportunity uh, because I was invited in. You know, I, I would never gone on my own. And I'm not sure, looking at what it takes now to get in, uh, I don't think I've gotten in. I mean, that's just a fact. Uh, but I worked in, in the, a lot of the stuff that I've already been accumulating. You know, I had trouble the, trying to figure out where is the point, the theological point? Where is the theological point of my work, of the history, the sociology, the reality and all this? Where is the theological point? And first I started to work on ecclesiology. And then I, you know... <laughs> I would full respect for my church because I love it very much. But I said, you know, the church is too messed up to study. You know, <laughs> <coughs> you know, I don't want to wait. You know, I love my church. I'm part of it. But I, I don't want to waste my time studying what it's supposed to be or not be, you know. Uh, that was the truth. I'm just sharing with you a very personal thing. But all of a sudden, some, uh, somewhere along the line, and I don't know where, uh, just in, you know, I did a lot of meditation in the parks. I, I sat in the outdoor restaurants and and just, just meditated and wrote. And so all of a sudden, again, the insight that the main emphasis of the New Testament is that Jesus was a Galilean, uh, that, that he was identified as a Galilean, and he came from Galilee. And they're constantly going forward. So the whole Galilee thing just began to fascinate me. And I studied whatever uh, information I could get at that time, which was very little at those days. Uh, and I started more and more to, to realize that the connection for us who had a deep devotion to Jesus Nazareno, uh, Jesus Nazare that the, the connection for us was to Jesus the Galilean. Uh, and then I started to go into scripture, and I'm not a scripture scholar, uh, so I tried to use scripture seriously, but I'm not a scholar in scripture. I simply borrow from those that are scholars in scripture. And I started to, I found this text in Romans, in Romans chapter three. Now, Romans chapter three is never part of the Catholic lectionary. I don't know about other lectionaries, <clears throat> but you know, in chapter 3, verses 9 to 18, he's got the hymn to evil. I don't know if you ever read it. I, I had never read it before. And then, you know, he says, there's not a single good person left. You know, in the empires of the world, there's no, no one left that can speak correctly, can, no one to search of God. It was a total corruption of humanity, the total perversion of humanity. And into that humanity, into that humanity, that's the humanity that God so loved the world, that God so loved us, that he became into ourselves. And then I started to go into, and I found this early Christological hymn in St. Paul, uh, a hymn that he picked up for those inspired hymns that were being sung by the early community. Uh, it seemed like it was in his own, that he who was by nature of divine condition, does not consider this something to be clung to, but he empties himself 
and becomes one among so many, one of the others, one that would be lost in the crowd. Uh, he becomes one of the others. <clears throat> and then going, keep, keep going into scripture, I found a text in the Acts of the Apostles which became kind of a programmatic text for me. Uh, the, the, reach, the, the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. That whole idea of rejection, because this is what we had suffered. This, this, what, this had been our life uh, of being marginal, being uh, in marginated from the world, uh, being considered inferior and being oppressed and so forth. So the rejection of Jesus became a very powerful theme for me. The stone rejected by the builders of a sinful society. The stone rejected by the builders that refers back to Genesis 11, the builders of cities, the builders of power and might. Uh, that they are the builders of a sinful society uh, and that the reject of the sinful society becomes a cornerstone. And then I found in Matthew and Mark the beautiful uh, mandate of the risen Lord that the risen Lord tells, go to Galilee, and there you will see me. And that was marvelous. Go to Galilee. If we want to see Jesus, the Jesus that we believed in, but didn't know much about, uh, the Jesus that we knew had suffered for us, but that's about all we knew, to go and, and discover his humanity, to rediscover just who was that human being that God had become. He had not become a generic human being. He had become a very specific cultural human being that through that, he could reveal something to humanity. Uh, and so I, I started to become fascinated with the humanity of Jesus, how to, how to recapture that humanity. And so that the, the, the beginning of the good news that Jesus came from Nazareth, a town in Galilee. So I started to look into what was Nazareth uh, and what was Nazareth, what was Galilee? Uh, and, and since then, I've taken several groups to Galilee and it's fascinating. Uh, when you look at the descent of God, when you descend of what human God became, because we always tend to think of a generic human. Uh, right now, if, you saw, if you've seen the film, The Son of God, I have not seen it, maybe some of you have seen it, but I heard a critique of it that the, that the person playing the, the, the person of Jesus is a very hunky Portuguese model. You know, <laughs> you know maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Uh, but, but and, you know, I mean, what portrait do we have of Jesus of Nazareth? Because God became human totally human, uh, and that's the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of the incarnation, what human did he become, what passport would he have carried, uh, what visas, what visas would he have been denied because of who he was. I started to ask those questions, and it became fascinating that in the descent of God, first of all, he'd become a Jew, and the Jews, you know, historically been the rejected of the world. I mean, they found a reason for existence in the fact that they were God's chosen people, but the word, very word apiru seems to mean the people without a name, the, 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 the people, uh, they, they were the nothings of the world. Uh, yet they found a reason for existence in the belief that God had chosen them. So there you have already the beginning. Uh, so Jesus in a way becomes a Jew, but not only a Jew, but a Galilean Jew. And there was a marked difference. There was a marked difference in the language, for example. Do you know that in some of the synagogues, in some of the synagogues to the time of Jesus, Galileans were prohibited from reading the scriptures in public because their accent was so bad that it was considered to be an insult to the word of God. Uh, so the way they spoke, I mean, Peter, Peter could deny Jesus, uh, could deny Jesus he couldn't deny he was a Galilean. Uh, some girl, hey, you're, open your mouth when you're Galilean. Uh, so the, the way you speak identifies you, uh, identifies where you're from. Um, right now in Texas, you can tell who's from, the, from West Texas by the way they speak, or who's from the Valley, uh, or, or New Yorker, or, you know, people have accents. Uh, so, so Jesus was a Galilean. He spoke Galilean. Uh, and for Galilean women, Galilean women are considered to be a disaster because they're considered to be in contact with the Gentiles. So they're automatically impure. Uh, and in, again, in a few of the, of the intertestamental literature, not all, but a few, says to marry a Galilean woman is the same of bestiality because she's legally impure. Now, all this to see... Mary was a Galilean. They call, the good news begins in Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee. And if that's not enough, Jesus becomes Jew, Galilean, Mary, uh, Mary, and son of Mary. The earliest St. Paul refers to so, born of a woman, simply a woman, uh, and then the early son of Mary, uh, sociologically speaking, sociologically speaking, Jesus was born 
with a father unknown. Uh, I mean, Jesus did many seminaries before the council. He would not have been admitted to the seminary because he, he had an illegitimate status. So look at who he becomes. Uh, God becomes in every sense existentially the reject of the world. Uh, and in that, begins, in that begins the good news. Uh, and that's what for us, one of the main points of, of our Christology is El Niño Jesús. El Niño Dios, we call it. The child God. We say it very few. El Niño Dios, the child God. Uh, because in the vulnerability, in the vulnerability of that baby born without a home, born of Galilean parents who didn't know each other, uh, born a Galilean, to be in Bethlehem was to be out of his home site. All the, to, to be born, this was the ultimate rejection. But yet in this, in this is the first revelation of the good news that the human as human is the image of God, that the human as human reveals the glory and the beauty of God. You know, and so we see that, that Jesus, in growing up, he, he, he grows up amongst the rejects of the world. Might have been a small town carpenter, might have been a handyman, who knows what it might be, a tecton, uh, which meant that nobody. Uh, but Jesus comes out of that rejection. And I find the baptism of Jesus such a beautiful story, uh, that Jesus, in a way, humanly speaking, drowns out, lets go of all those inferiority complexes he probably had as a human being. Uh, because he probably suffered those inhuman. He suffered those injustices. He suffered those remarks of his playmates who made fun of him, maybe. I remember one kid I had, you know, that was, remind me of much of this. Uh, he, he was the, the son of a kept woman, a man who was married to another woman. And this kid had had contact with his father twice. One time he was a little child, and his father spent the night with his mother. And in the morning, he was having breakfast, and the little kid spilled his coffee, and it fell on the man's leg, and it burned him. And the man slapped him so hard that he lost hearing in one ear. And then the second time he met his dad was when the, uh, when the legitimate son of this man started making fun of him in the schoolyard for being the bastard son, you know. So he beat him up. You know, he was stronger than, than the, the legitimate son. So he beat him. So that night, the father came home to give him a whipping because he had insulted his real son. You know, he, said left, he left him so sore he couldn't sit for two or three weeks. You know, and that was the only memory he had of his father. Uh, he was the ultimate rejection. Uh, what is your status? Uh, and we live with this. Uh, and, and so humanly speaking, when God assumes the suffering of the world, when God becomes flesh, he becomes this hurt humanity, this wounded humanity, uh, the, the, this hurting humanity, the, the, the feeling of rejection, of, be, of being nothing, of being inferior. But in the, in the baptism, he drowns his feelings. That's why I find the baptism so beautiful. I call that the conversion of Jesus. Uh, we always talk about conversion to Jesus, but we don't speak about the conversion of Jesus as a human. Uh, that in a way, he, he lets go. Uh, and here you have a completely new Jesus coming forth, one that's fearless, one that will face anyone, speak to anyone, one that will face the kings and leaders and all that, and he's going to be a fearless leader. Uh, so you have the drowning out, uh, and you hear that beautiful voice of God that I think we've all heard in a moment, in some moment of grace. This is my beloved child. Listen to him. I'm sure you've heard that at some time or another. Uh, that's what pulls you out, uh, that no matter what everybody is saying about you, good or bad, the ultimate, the ultimate identity is you're a child of God. Uh, you're a child of God made to the image and likeness of God. And so now Jesus comes out full of the Spirit, but he's still tempted. He's taken into the desert. He's taken to the desert, and they're temptations of a good man, temptations of a good person. Uh, they're not the temptations of an evil one. An evil person doesn't have temptations. They just do it, you know? They don't even think about it, you know? But, but, a, but a good person, a good person will feel the temptation, will feel the pain, I can tell people in the confessional, and there's no where I feel more of a priest in the confessional, you know, when people come in and tell me something really bad about themselves, and God, they're so embarrassed, so ashamed, I can honestly tell them, I can see that you're very good. Because if you're not very good, you would not be here. You would not even thought about it, you know. But it's a sense of guilt. Uh, and and so, so here now, Jesus goes out and is tempted, is tempted to, to be a, just a social worker. And social workers are good, they're necessary but not by bread alone, not by bread alone. And poor people, yes, they need lots of things, but they need that sense of dignity. They need a sense of identity. Uh, and this is what they need most, not by bread alone, those men hate. 
And then you can be the most powerful in the world. Uh, you can be the most powerful political leader. Power alone doesn't save. Uh, power alone doesn't save. It's something greater. And I'll take you to the heights of the temple, religion. Uh, that was the deepest temptation of Jesus, religion. You practice this rule, that rule, that rule, you'll be saved. And, uh, the, you know, jump down, the angels will catch you. Uh, superficial religion, ritual religion. Uh, that's not alone. That's not enough. Because Jesus goes out. Jesus goes out to reject the deepest level of human rejection. Jesus is the reject who rejects rejection. Uh, in what he proclaims, the kingdom of God is for everyone. Convert. Uh, we're all sinners. Convert. Um, I mean, I, I was very moved by our Holy Father when he called the Jesuits to, uh, to pray for the grace of vergüenza. Uh, pray for the grace of that profound embarrassment of that sin that you have committed that you have not yet realized. Because sometimes that's the worst sin of all. Sometimes that's the worst sin. That we're all sinners. So how do we hear that universal call to conversion, to be cleansed, to be cleansed? And, he, and Jesus invites us all, but he lifts it out. He lifts it out, and I find this uh, the most beautiful aspect about Jesus. Uh, I think Eva's writing on it. Uh, and I got this concept from American Baptist. Some of you might have read this little booklet, uh, Rediscovering the Teachings of Jesus. A uh, Norman Perrin. You might have read this little book about 20 years ago, 30 years ago now. Uh, Rediscovering the Teaching of Jesus. What he says in that book, and I think that's correct, uh, that the most radical thing Jesus did was not what he said, because at those, time, at those things he was saying were kind of being said by others at that time. So, and it, it wasn't what he said, it was what he did. And what he did was the most radical of all was the joy of inclusive table fellowship. That was the most radical thing Jesus did, where he actually lived out the kingdom he was preaching about, uh, that God is present amongst us and within us. Uh, and so therefore he scandalized everyone because he refused to be scandalized by anyone. That that was the, the, the radical newness of Jesus, uh, to be able to accept human beings for who they were and to go beyond the stereotype to go beyond the stereotype, not to see a prostitute or a carpenter or anything, to see Mary, Joseph, Peter, Matthew, to see the person, to see the beauty of the person, and to bring them together. When you realize your own beauty, uh, you realize your own inner beauty and status and dignity, you begin to change. Uh, it's not when you see how fat, bad you are. It's when you realize how good you are, you can become better. Uh, and so I think that this table fellowship of Jesus, here's the reject who rejects rejection and enjoys it. And enjoys it, and in, in, enjoys it because it's one who invites uh, to transcend the dilemma, to transcend the dilemma of you versus us, uh, and to transcend the dilemma of becoming a new us together, uh, a new us of all background. And because of this, uh, people think it's crazy. I mean, have you read the New Testament from the point of view of the rejection of Jesus? It's amazing. I mean, his own family. You remember what his own family wanted to do? They thought he was crazy. They thought to take him away, put him away safely. You know, people thought he was crazy. People thought he was possessed by demons. Uh, not only demons, by the prince of demons, Belzebub. Uh, uh, I mean, the rejection of Jesus in his time was unbelievable. Uh, uh, and, and so in a way, Jesus, in the New Testament, and I think this is very appealing to me and maybe to all of us in ministry, he gets very frustrated because even the closest disciples don't get it. Even the disciples don't get it. Are you too hard-headed, you know? Too hard to understand and so forth. So he takes off. He take, his mission is to go to Jerusalem. But if you notice the map, he goes in a different direction. He goes to Caesarea Philippi. Uh, and even now, by bus, it's two hours away. You know, he goes further away into pagan territory. But there, there, he's confronted. Who do you say that I am? Uh, the question he asks all of us. Uh, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Oh, you're so-and-so and so-and-so. And so and so. I'm all the good things. But who do you say that I am? And Peter answers correctly but wrongly. Uh, he answers, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and so forth. And you say, yeah. But then he begins to clarify. Jesus begins to clarify. Uh, the Messiah has to suffer and die. Uh, unless you're willing to take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Uh, Jesus begins calling them to the cross. Uh, the cross of the nine self for the good of the whole. Of the nine self for the good of humanity. Uh, of the nine self for, for the good of all those that, that are truly have a pure heart and are searching for God. Uh, and so he denied, and then he goes to Mount Tabor. And there is, the, there is his tra transfiguration. There is where they ultimately see who Jesus really is, uh, the, the Son of God. And, and so, in a way, in Caesarea Philippi is the turning point, the turning point of Jesus. And then he starts to announce, 
he must go. He must go to Jerusalem. I remember Peter Berger saying, don't never follow a happy prophet, you know. A, a happy prophet is not a real prophet, you know. Uh, Jesus never said, hey, let's go, you know. He said, I must go. Uh, it's a divine must. What you realize, it's great to make people feel good about themselves. I consider the, the Galilean ministry the picnic ministry. Jesus having a good time outdoors with the people. Preaching in the outdoors, just really the beautiful ministry. But then you realize it's not enough. It's not enough to help people really discover true self. He must go to the sources. He must go to the sources of, of the power. Uh, and that's where he begins to announce, I must go to Jerusalem. Uh, and he goes to Jerusalem, and he goes to the center of powers. And the triumphant entry, I find it very beautiful, in fact, especially with, with Palm Sunday coming up this Sunday, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, the, the two choruses, I don't know if you ever noticed, two choruses in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, the city, the city becomes deeply disturbed, and they ask, who is this man? Uh, the city had become disturbed twice. They had become disturbed when the Magi had come in, and they, now they've become disturbed again, deeply disturbed. The, the, the ones that know, the professors, the theologians, the, these scholars, the ones that should know, don't know. And they ask, who is this? And the plebe, the people, they know. Jesus, the son of David, the Savior. Uh, the two courses come in. Uh, and the people bring him in. Uh, it's the poor, the rejected, the marginalized. They know it's their Savior. Uh, they know it's the newness of life coming in. And they usher him into Jerusalem triumphantly. He goes right away to the temple. He right away goes to the temple, and the temple confrontation is profound. Uh, we challenge the temple because my house is a house of prayer for all the peoples of the world. That's beautiful. Uh, where can people have access to God? Where people can have access to God and to each other? Uh, and that's in the temple. Uh, and so he, he, he criticized the temple. He criticized one by using another prophet, Jeremiah. Uh, I, it takes... Uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah 7. Uh, but you have made it a den of thieves. When religion hides the sins of the rich and oppresses the poor, adding guilt to them, then religion has become a den of thieves. What Jesus criticized here is uh, the, the perversion of religion itself. Not religion, but the perversion of religion itself. When the religion becomes a caste, only we can enter. Religion was a house of God for everyone. But the greatest oppression is the keeping out of the poor. And what Jeremiah is criticizing was that the Jewish people had forgotten they had been slaves in Egypt. And they now they were oppressing their own, their brothers, their sisters, their nephews, their uncles, their relatives. And they were coming to the temple and offering the fruit in the temple of the work of their labor, breaking the backs of the poor and offering their fruits as, as the pleasing to God. And that makes religion a den of thieves. And I think there's a very deep question for us today. In, in who does religion take money from? Are we building temples? Uh, are we building the temples that hide the sins of the rich? Uh, are we making it a den of thieves? Because this is what Jesus, and therefore he must die. Every prophet has to be eliminated. Uh, every prophet has to be, because the truth, the truth of the prophet is self-evident. The, the prophet speaks and, and what, because he simply enunciates what everybody knows already, but nobody has said. And therefore, upon hearing people say, yeah, right on. You know, a prophet doesn't need proof. The proof is in the experience of the people. Uh, and so the only way to quiet a prophet is to get rid of him or to kill him. I mean, that's the way it has been in our age. That's the way it was in Salvador with our special Romero. That's the way it was in Guatemala with some of our missions being killed. Uh, Christians are being killed today for the same reason. And so they decide then that Jesus must go to the cross. But he goes to the cross, and there we find, with Good Friday coming up, the beautiful words from the cross. I mean, they, they are the most fascinating words to me. I mean, the very first words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, the radical forgiveness. of Jesus is consistent in death as he is in life. Uh, his mission was to unite humanity, to unite humanity by, by converting and forgiving. Uh, and he calls us to, to, to forgiveness. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He forgives the thief. The good thief calls him Jesus, probably a boyhood friend. And he calls him by his first name, Jesus, remember me when you enter into paradise. And Jesus tells him, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, that compassion. Uh, it doesn't say you're right or wrong. It's the compassion, the mercy. 
the un unlimited mercy of God's heart that comes through. And I think that the most beautiful words come in, in, in John's gospel. John, in a way, in my opinion, uh, is the gospel of Mary. Because the gospel begins with Mary telling Jesus they have no wine. Uh, she kind of, you know, she's a good Jewish mother. Jesus has been living at home for 30 years. He says, son, get with it, you know. <laughs> get, get with it, you know. It's time for you to do something, you know. Uh, it, it, there's a little humor in it. It's a little beautiful humor in the, in the wedding feast of Cana, you know. But it's Mary who starts him off. Huh? And now at the cross, at the final moment, the final words, the final words of, of the dying Jesus, huh? Women, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And from that moment on, the disciple took her home. I contend my own self, there's no Christian home without Mary at the center. In the Spanish way, it's la ama de casa, uh, the one that produces love in the home, uh, the one that produces mercy and kindness in the home, the ama de casa. There's not a good translation for that. Housewife is not a translation at all. Uh, the, the ama, the, the love producer in the home. Uh, and, and so Jesus had given us the Our Father in life, now gives us the Our Mother. To, to, and now, knowing that everything was complete, he bows his head. He looks upon those who have never abandoned him. He gives forth the Spirit. He gives forth the Spirit. And he says the words, it's complete. Uh, the beautiful words of triumph, I have completed the task, is not the words of failure. It's the words of triumph. I have completed the task. Against all odds, you have not forced me to stop loving you. Uh, that's the power of the cross. And that's what makes the cross so beautiful. Uh, that's what makes the cross the ugliest thing there is, the most cruel and bloody and ugly thing there is. The cross turns into something else so beautiful that no amount of resistance, no amount of resistance, no amount of vengeance or anything that was thrown upon Jesus could force him to stop loving us. He loved us till the end, even at the, at the cost of the cross. The obedience of Jesus was not to go jump on the cross, but to love us even unto the cross. And so that makes it across the, 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 the instrument of triumph, of, of, of success, of breakthrough. But at that moment, those who had never abandoned him, the beloved disciple and the women, in a way, Raymond Brown has a beautiful opinion on this. They were the first ones to receive the Spirit. Uh, it was kind of a mini Pentecost because they had never abandoned Jesus. They had been with him till the end, and they received the Pentecost to be able to interpret, to be able to proclaim. And then we have the resurrection. Where, where one whom the world had killed, God had raised from the dead. The most beautiful event. What the resurrection is, I don't know, but I believe it. You know, I believe that's a cornerstone. If, if Christ had not risen, your faith is in vain. Uh, and so the cross without the resurrection would be empty, but the resurrection without the cross would also be empty. Uh, and so the two, uh, that the one whom the world has crucified, the builders of this world have crucified, uh, and the builders of this world continue to crucify the prophets. Uh, I've been told by a good friend of mine who, who speaks very loudly on immigration the amount of hate mail he gets, hate mails from good Catholics uh, who, who are totally against him because, you know, that's un-American what he's teaching. Uh, he's teaching to the Gospels. So, so Jesus is now the new man, uh, but he produces also, he produces a new human group. In the Acts of the Apostles, uh, look at now the beautiful thing. The Galileans were people nobody could understand. Their language was so confusing, it was, it was totally unintelligible. In Pentecost, it's the Galileans that everybody can understand. Uh, it's a complete reversal. The ones that had nothing to offer now had the best thing to offer. Now had a, and the language of agape, the language of the, the unlimited love of God, that radical just love of God that goes beyond all else. And, and so they now began to proclaim, you killed him, but God raised him. And they began now a new human group. The early Christianity in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the early Christianity, I contend that Christian identity is fundamentally the hyphenated identity. Uh, that's my contention, you can the question. Uh, because the early Christians, they did not see as being who they were, ethnically or otherwise, but they became new. They became something new. Uh, for example, uh, the first ones to convert, the priests. And they're the hardest group to convert. Uh, and, and they're the first one to go. But then the story of Cornelius, it's a beautiful story. Cornelius was a Roman, Peter was a Galilean. For the Romans, the only good Galilean was a dead Galilean. And for the Galileans, the only good Roman was a dead Roman. 
Uh, and now, in the power of the Spirit, Peter breaks through, and he goes to the home of Cornelius, and they share a meal. And in that context, he receives the Spirit, because God does not play favorites. God, so he becomes now a Roman Christian. Peter was a Galilean Christian, a Galilean Jewish Christian. Now Cornelius becomes a Greek Christian. Uh, the Ethiopian becomes an Ethiopian Christian. Uh, the Greeks will become Greek Christians. And we have the first synthesis uh, where they interpreted in through Greek categories the Christian message. So they were now Greek Christians. Uh, and then the Romans, the law, has to become Christianized. So they become Roman Christians. Christianity, I contend, is fundamentally a hyphenated existence. It affirms who you are, but it, it makes breakthroughs so that you're no longer absolutely yourself. You're open to the others. You're open to give and to receive. Uh, and, and therefore, Christianity becomes a, a really a third race, what the early Christians were called. They become a third race because it becomes a unity of peoples who are who they are and produce something new. And I think that today, I think that today, this is what Christianity is calling us to. The world is changing rapidly. The world is changing rapidly. When you see the, the massive migrations taking place, the massive migrations, um, I was just in Italy re recently talking to them precisely about what in northern Italy now, they have mainly Africans, Eastern Europeans, and people from the Arab countries. Uh, a complete mixture of people, of Hindus, of Buddhists, of Muslims, of Orthodox, and of, this country has been totally Catholic, totally Italian. Uh, Germany, they have people from Indonesia there, and from Greece, uh, they have, and Turkey. Uh, Spain has many people from Africa now, and Latin America. Uh, Holland has many people from, from Indonesia. Uh, so uh, England, they tell that London is the most, has the most ethnically mixed congregations of anywhere in the world. Something like 87 ethnicities uh, worship in London. So the world's coming together in ways that it never became before. And it seems to me that in the power of the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit, we pick up with the suffering. We pick up with the suffering and hear their wisdom. And hear the wisdom, and, and allow that wisdom to permeate, to come through. Allow the wisdom to come through, and allow the, the voice of the poor to be the evangelizing power of all of us. And I think that this is a new human community that we're called, that God knows no human partiality, that God is present, that we have to see the moment as a gift of God, uh, as a gift of God has problems in it, but has immense possibilities. And, and it's up to us to have that, that sensitivity to discover the possibilities uh, and to create them. So that to me is my, the, my own way of seeing uh, Jesus as, as God becomes human. And I keep asking myself just what human being did he become? And I think he became beautifully the reject of the world, rejects rejection, ends up being rejected by everyone only to be chosen by God. To be chosen by God to be the instrument of a new creation, of a new humanity. So that is the humanity that I, that I long for, that I work for, and that I believe will come in. Because in many ways it is coming in. Driving here yesterday, I passed by a church that, that celebrated, not that it was real, celebrated the playing card. Here, 19 ethnicity worship. Uh, it was beautiful. One church, 19 groups. Uh, so we evolved that, that new spirit. That is the spirit of Pentecost. That is the spirit that guides us to, to break, make the breakthroughs to learn from each other and to become one human family. So thank you very much. And that's my, my Galilean synthesis. So thank you. And I'm open for questions now. I will remind you of our rules for questions. We have 15 minutes. Um, please keep your questions direct and clear. Um, talk into the microphone, um, and remember to introduce yourselves. And those that are at home, you can post questions into YouTube. All right. So first, students, if we have any questions from students. Hi, uh, Eric Landon, MDiv student. 
Uh, you, you, you said near the end um, that, that we should allow the, the, uh, the poor to become the evangelizing power of all of us. Could you give a, a story or an example of how you see that played out in our world today? Thank you. Uh, I think I had the experience of it personally. I've had it all my life. Uh, but I think I had it mainly when I was at the cathedral in San Antonio. You know, the cathedral is the oldest, the oldest cathedral sanctuary in the country. It was built in 1731 by the Spanish colonizers, and it's always served the poor Mexican people. <clears throat> it was really a cathedral of the poor. Uh, one time I was having a wedding. Uh, it was an elegant wedding. It was a high society wedding. And they had, because high society people like the cathedral because it's very beautiful. And so they had the limousines come in, and they had their fur coats on. It was about 60 degrees, but they still had their big fur coats on. And chauffeur, you know, they had capped chauffeurs and all that. And the, the mother of the bride it walked out with her purse and all that. And this back lady, this back lady was standing in the, in the door of the church. And I knew the back lady pretty well. Uh, she had always painted her cheeks a lot. And she carried all her belongings in, in, a, in, a, in a cart, in a grocery store cart. And so the lady comes in, and this lady recognizes her. They'd gone to school together. And she recognizes the rich lady, and she says, oh, I'm so glad to see you, you know. And, and you could tell the rich lady was trying to put her away, you know. So, so she finally, and I caught her something, and then she said, well, and then she said real loud, I really am pleased that you've come to my church for the wedding of your daughter. See, I thought that was beautiful. I thought that was beautiful, uh, that you've come to my church for the wedding of your daughter. Uh, she was welcoming. She was welcoming the poor. She was welcoming with everybody. But the poor reject no one. Uh, the rich reject the poor. For example, if you send an invitation out, and you, precisely if you send it to everyone, uh, uh, the ones that are normally in the sense of belonging won't want to come uh, because they don't want to mix with everybody. I mean, that's very much in the Gospels. When Jesus invites him and says, I'm sorry, I've got, just got married, or I just bought a cow, this, I can't go. Uh, so they don't go not because they're not invited, but precisely because everybody's invited. Uh, I also got a, a beautiful sense. I remember uh, I worked a lot with prostitutes because I mentioned last night, I never realized there was so much prostitution in San Antonio until I went to the cathedral. It's right downtown, the center of the city. And it was for the, for the, it was just the beginning of AIDS. So there was still a lot of prostitution and all that. And I found out they were my parishioners. They were in my parish. And they were walking the streets in my parish. So I got to know a few of them, and they all, had they all had tragic stories, just really stories of incredible pain. But I remember one of them, you know, who was a very handsome kid. He was a male prostitute, and he told me something I never knew or suspected, that because San Antonio was a military town, that there was a big demand for male prostitutes. You know, and so he was working the streets. Uh, well, I, I, I got to be friends with many of them. Some have good endings, some don't. But this one had a good ending. Uh, he started going to church. He started going to church. Eventually, he got involved in an adult uh, baptismal class. Uh, and he was a fellow that, that didn't know who his father was. He longed to know who his father was, but he didn't know who his father was. Uh, and he was, I could say, oh, and, and, and that's why he was looking for men. He was looking for the affection of a man that he never had. You know, and so anyway, he started going, and as he discovered the, the meaning of the Our Father, he could not pray the Our Father without breaking into tears. He really understood in a, in a profound way uh, the fatherhood of God, you know, and he shared that with us. I think that was evangelizing all of us. Uh, he understood the power of that God is our, really our Father. So regardless who is our, our, our flesh, our uh, flesh and blood Father, it's that real fatherhood of God, you know. I remember, I thought it was a beautiful insight of him. I had several others. Uh, uh, the confianza in God, the intimacy with God. We had the big black Christ, which is very, very powerful with people, especially from Guatemala, but also from Mexico. El Cristo Negro de Esquipulas is very, very powerful. And I actually had the statue brought in in saw the cathedral. And people used to put in their prayers written there, pictures of their kids and all that and their prayers. And once a month, I would take them down, and I, store, I had boxes where I kept them because I respected them too much. But I would read some of them. And I remember reading one of them. It says, uh, Dear Lord, you know the man I'm living with now is no good, but I need a man. Find me a good one. 
You know, that prayer would appear blasphemous to some people. I found it beautiful. I found the intimacy with God, you know. I mean, that, that's why I think that there is something in the voice of the poor. Uh, oh, you'll hear a lot of crazy stuff too, you know. Uh, but you'll hear that, that, be, that beautiful voice come in of, of complete confidence in God. That's probably, como va la vida? And there might be, you know, how's life going? And they make all kinds of, ah, oh, pues va bien, padre. It's going okay. God is good. That sense of the goodness of God. You know, those are some of the things that I've, le- that I've learned to really appreciate f- from working amongst the poor. Uh, the migrants have a tremendous sense of God's providence. God, they, they're unbelievable. They're unbelievable in the sense that, that, that God is protecting them. So, so I think just listening to them, uh, our Holy Father, again, for us Catholics, is really, he said, you know, just listen, have an intense listening. It's so much harder to, to really, so much harder to listen than to speak. That's why I thank all of you, because you've been listening all morning. You know, I've had the easy part. I've been speaking. But really, it, it's so much harder to, to really listen to people and not just to shove them off, you know. And, and, and you know, when you really listen to someone, it, it, you are telling them you're dignified. I mean, that's already an announcement of the good news, that, that you're someone to me, and therefore I'm listening to you, you know. So even in that, it's already an announcement of the good news. So I hope that kind of answered around it. It was a great question. Thank you. Another question? My name is Eugenio. I've been a former student here many years ago and uh, now <clears throat> working in Latin America. Um, my question is related to how can we empower the poor in concrete ways uh, in a world of prejudice and rejection? You know, I can, I can only speak because most of my work has been in this country. I'm aware of Latin America, but my work has not been in Latin America. it has been more Hispanics here in this country. I, I think the first thing, really, I find the question of identity so profound. I find the question of identity to empower people by having them a sense of the human, uh, having a sense that, that you're human, you know, because many, many of our minorities, especially the, the, you see, what I said before, the migrant knows that they're migrant. They know where they come from and know where they're at. The children of the migrant don't know who they are. Uh, and that, that's the big issue. They're neither here nor there. Uh, and how to create the ability to bring the two worlds together and to say, hey, and to celebrate, to celebrate the fact I'm something new. N- not that I'm a misfit, not that I'm an outsider, not, I'm just the beginning of new creation, new humanity. And humanity is always recreating itself. So there will always be outside groups and inside groups, but I think to the degree that the poor, and let me give a concrete example. In, in San Antonio, we organized, thanks to Chicago, which helped us, uh, a community for, uh, for public service. COPS, we call it, C-O-P-S, Community of Public Service. And it was to train basic neighborhood leaders, neighborhood leaders, to, to, to tackle local issues, uh, local issues. Well, we, we had a neighborhood association meeting, and they were questioning the candidates for the mayor of the town. And they were questioning, and they were questioning on one issue, how they were going to vote on the building of a bridge over a, a, a creek where a lot of the children had to go around to the main highway and often got killed. And they wanted a bridge built so the kids could cross the bridge. Uh, and so they were having a community-wide meeting. Uh, we'd been working with the people already, and these were grassroots people. So pretty soon there was a big auditorium full. Pretty soon this elderly lady walks down the aisle like this, the microphone was up front. She walked down, she's kind of bow-legged, her hair's all over the place, and she kind of walks, you know, and she gets to the microphone and she goes, no, she taps the microphone, boom, 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 you know. And so she speaks in very broken English, in very broken English. She says, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm just a dumb, simple, clean-up woman. I don't know what you're talking about. I just want to know, are you going to vote yes or no? That was the question of the evening. Uh, but the, here was a resurrection experience. Here was a resurrection. This woman was, in effect, just a simple, poor, dumb, clean-up woman. All of, a sudden she, she, all of a sudden, she came out of the tomb. She came out of the tomb of enslavement, and she was somebody. And all of a sudden, that didn't matter. 
she walked up and she asked the question of the evening. Uh, that was resurrection. Uh, that was res to, and to lead people to experience that, uh, not to be ashamed of their past, to experience that they have a power in them. They have a power when they come together, that divine power works through them. Uh, and, and it's just beautiful. So I'll give you other examples. But it, it's, a, it's a way of empowering the poor to give them a sense of dignity and to give them a sense of accomplishment. Uh, by the way, community organizing never tackled an issue they could not win. They always analyze it very carefully. They're very sophisticated. No, the Sololinsky method. But we combine the Sololinsky method with the proper religion of the people. And that's what really made it work in San Antonio. Uh, that it wasn't, it wasn't as it was here in Chicago, but it was totally, for example, on Sunday mornings in church, we'd pray uh, at, the, you know, at the penitential rite. Let us pray for the repentance of the mayor that he may change his mind on this particular issue. Uh, Lord, have mercy. You know, <laughs> on that, let, let us pray for Mr. Tom Frost, who's head of the Frost Bank and won't lend money to the poor areas. Christ, have mercy. You know, uh, always personalize the issues, they told us. Uh, I'd always learn, never personalize the issue. Well, I learned in community org, always personalize the issue because there's a person behind them. You know? So anyway, but that gets people a sense of dignity. So the faith combined with practical, the, the practical elements. I don't know if that would work in Latin America. Latin America is a very different scene. Uh, it's a very different scene than the U.S. But in the U.S., in, in the barrios, it worked. Hi, my name is Damari Rios. I'm an MDiv student. Um, so my question is, um, so I'm Puerto Rican. My family is all from the island. And when I grew up as a child around many different Latinos from different backgrounds, I always grew up them saying, you know, si Dios quiere, if God willing. So a lot of us that are first generation in this country, we see a lot of our family as though they're lacking some of that oomph to do something because it is so much of God willing, right? And so how do you, I mean, do you experience that and how do we work with first generations or, you know, and then those that are from their country, how do we work that out? Because I feel that a lot of the first generation children are breaking away so much from who they are because they see it as more of a complacent, kind of a God willing thing. And so I'm not seeing a lot of them experiencing what you just mentioned about that lady where they had that oomph, you know? There are some fighters, but I'm just not seeing that on a regular basis. There's no general answer. Yes, I know. <laughs> There's no general answer for all, all the communities. Huh? As they say, all politics is local. Uh, all churches are local, really. Um, I think it's a Dios quiere attitude. It's a beautiful attitude that I hope we never lose. It's a profound belief, a profound confidence, a profound trust in God. You know, and that gives a tremendous amount of freedom. It gives a tremendous freedom. On the other hand, it can be abused. It can be an excuse for not doing anything. Uh, and, and, that's, and, and that's wrong. Uh, and so I think, again, how do, you, how do you combine that, knowing that the ultimate result rests in God's hands? Uh, to do everything you can knowing that the ultimate result belongs to God. I mean, that, that's a beautiful combination. So it's not just to sit back, say, bueno, pues a ver si Dios quiere, you know, which often is the case. For example, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't know how it is in Chicago, but in San Antonio, one of our biggest problems with the Mexican-American community is... Um, our political apathy. We don't vote. I mean, we worked very hard in getting the vote out, you know, getting people to vote. And we, at best, we got 11% of the people to vote uh, because of this. This is the, the, the negative side. Why not? Va a salir como quiera. You know, he's going to come out. No, why should I vote? No, well, so, so, so this has been a, 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 a debilitating thing. But I think as we work to, que lo que Dios quiere es que entremos en la lucha that what God wants is to enter into the struggle. Uh, and what God's will is that you, be, that, you be, that you take the vote seriously, that you take the vote because it's your voice. Uh, and, and that is beginning to, it, it's changed somewhat, but it's a real, it's a real, because in Latin American politics, really, the democracies of Latin America, and some of you may know much better than I do, have worked in a very different way. Uh, and so a lot of people came here and come with a cultural apathy to politics. You know, and, and so that to transfer into the, and, and really, it's a bigger problem for the U.S. because the U.S. as a whole is voting less and less. So we're abdicating power to just a few. So it's a general problem, but it certainly has affected 
I don't know about the Puerto Rican community, but it certainly affected the Mexican community. Uh, that, that's it, the Dios quiere and leaving it up to God. Uh, but I think we, we include that in our, in our preaching, our teaching, and, and try to make a difference where we're at. But it, it, it is a problem. Well, I want to thank you very, very much. You've been a great audience, and thank you for inviting me, and it's been great to be here and share with you. And I really enjoyed it, enjoyed your comments, your questions, and if you have any other questions or anything, well, I'll be around here and be glad. I don't have answers to a lot of things. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm really, a, and I, I said it's no, no false humility. I consider myself a simply grassroots priest who is working to bring betterment to my people. And working to, 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 to what we believe that we have a profound faith, but it always needs to be purified. It always has to be purified in the light of the gospel. And that will be an ongoing process. In an ongoing process of time, yes, we have something good, but not perfect. Far from it. And so to, to, to realize that and to be able to keep working with it, to make it a, a better church, more brilliant church, and one that's more inclusive of all peoples. And I think that's our task. And I, I think I've done a little bit, others should do more. And it's just fun to be a part of it, fun to be part of the process. So thank you very much. Thank you for all your questions, for all you're doing, for the great visit last night. And I've been very, very blessed to be amongst you. Thank you. just want to give one more thank you to you and one of the things I hope is you you talked about revelation as um, flowers and songs you've given us so many flowers so thank you I hope we can respond with songs in our hearts and new growth from all that you said so thanks again for coming yes.